Esther chapter 3. I don't have a lot of time, so what I want to do is just, uh, I had already planned on this. I'm just going to kind of hit the high points. We're not going to dig real deep into it, but, um, but it is an important lesson. The title of this morning's message is, Trusting God's Providence in Disappointment and Fear. You remember I told you last week that Esther is a book that God is never mentioned in. The name of God, you will not find it in this book. Matter of fact, there have been some great, great reformers of old, uh, Martin Luther being one of them, that didn't even think this book ought to be in the Bible because of the fact that it does not mention God. I would disagree greatly with him because of the fact that even though the name of God is never mentioned, God is in every detail of this book. You cannot miss the work of God and what He is doing. And this is what we call providence. We're talking about God's ability to be able to see into and provide for the good of His people and for His glory. How does God do that? He has providence and He is able to see into it. It's kind of like as a father and a husband in my household. Or maybe you're a single mother with children. But you are able to see enough to know that if I don't do this and this and this, then my children are not going to have what they need. Amen? And so a father's responsibility or a single mother's responsibility is to to provide, which we get providence from. And their job is they have to be able to look far enough ahead to be able to know that I need to do this and this and this in order to provide what my family needs. God is the greatest at that that there ever has been or ever will be. Because He knows all things. He sees the the beginning of a thing all the way to its end. And He knows how to provide for those that belong to Him. But Esther is a story of Jews that God kept in Persia while when we were studying Ezra and Nehemiah, They were leading groups back, and you might remember that the Bible says that they led the groups of people back that God had stirred in their heart to go back to Jerusalem. So in other words, in God's sovereignty and in God's providence, God saw fit that He was going to stir the hearts of some to go back to Jerusalem and rebuild, right? And then there was going to be some that their hearts weren't stirred, and they stayed in Persia. Now, does that mean that the ones that went back were greater in the eyes of God than the ones that stayed? No, absolutely not. God, in His providence, knows exactly who needs to be where in order to fulfill His purpose. God knew who needed to be in Jerusalem to be able to rebuild the temple. God knew who needed to remain in Persia because He knew what the devil was going to do in Persia. And what we have in Esther is we have God setting the pieces up so that when the enemy comes to try to attack, which he is coming, how many of y'all know that? When the enemy comes to try to attack because the enemy hates God and the enemy hates God's people. And at the end of the day, his goal is to destroy God's kingdom. He wants worship for himself. He does not want God to be worshipped, and as a result of that, he is trying to stop God from building his kingdom out of a people of faith that will worship God forever and enjoy God forever, and he from the beginning has been trying to stop that, and he continues it to this very day. And so in the book of Esther, we have the story of the group of people that stayed in Persia while the other group was going back to rebuild Jerusalem. And you remember when we were studying Ezra and Nehemiah that the enemy was attacking over there. Y'all remember those stories? I can't go back and re-preach Ezra and Nehemiah, but just trust me. The enemy was attacking and trying to stop the work. He was trying to shut the people down. And at the same time, in Persia, he's going to put together a plan to to destroy and to annihilate all of the Jews in a single day. And so we're going to be able to look at this plan and how to trust God's providence in disappointment and fear. Now just so you would know, when we get to the end of chapter 2, now Daniel read chapter 3 to you, but what you may not know, in chapter 2, God has raised up a new queen. You remember chapter 1 from last week, right? 
He's deposed a queen and now he has opened up a beauty contest to where all of the women in Persia, all the beautiful women, let me say this, all the beautiful women in Persia he has called in and now he gets to, the king gets to make a decision on who it's going to be. And wouldn't you know, out of all the ladies in 127 provinces of Persia, out of all of them, he picks a young Jewish girl to be his queen. But this Jewish girl's parents died when she was young. And so she has been raised by her cousin Mordecai. Mordecai has told her, you keep your ethnicity a secret. Don't let anybody know. And so we know from that that apparently the people looked down on the Jewish race as it was. So the only reason she gets to become this is because God's providence and in God's providence He tells her to keep her ethnicity a secret so she's keeping it a secret and then at the end of chapter 2 while Esther is queen Mordecai, her cousin who raised her overhears a plot of two of the king's eunuchs that want to kill the king. He goes and he tells Esther. Esther goes and tells the king. And he saves the king's life. And at the end of chapter 2, the last thing it tells us is that it was recorded in the book of the Chronicles, the Persian book of Chronicles of the king. In other words, everything that happened in the king's life is recorded in this book. And they record what Mordecai did to save this king's life in the presence of the king. But here's what happens in chapter 3. It starts out in verse 1 that after these things... The king doesn't promote Mordecai. The king promotes an enemy of Mordecai. Now I want you to think about the disappointment that was in Mordecai's life. Think about this for just a minute, okay? Mordecai has just saved the king's life. Now you would expect, if you're Mordecai, that the king is going to honor you, right? But the king does not honor him. And we think to ourselves, man, how disappointing, how wrong. But what we don't know is that in the future, in God's providence, because remember, God can see from the beginning of a thing all the way to the end. God meant for Mordecai to not be honored. Because when we get to Esther chapter 6, here's what happens. The plan of the enemy is to annihilate all the Jews. Well, that night in chapter 6, the king cannot sleep. He's tossing and he's turning on his bed and he gets up and he tells one of his servants, go get me a book to read. And so the servant brings this book of the Chronicles of the King back. And the king just happens to open up to the spot where it was written that Mordecai had saved his life. Now the enemy is thinking that the king is fixing to honor him. And so the king says, what would you do? He calls this enemy Haman in and he asks this enemy, he says, what would you do for the man that the king wants to honor? Now the enemy's thinking, this is me. The king wants to honor me. So the enemy is saying, well, you know what I would do? I would make him second in command over all of your kingdom. I would put him on a horse and I would parade him through the entire uh, provinces of Persia and I would let everyone know that this is the second in charge of all of my kingdom. And the king says, you know what, that sounds like a great idea. Now go get Mordecai and do that for him. My point is this. In disappointment, it would have been very easy for Mordecai to have stepped down and just simply said, you know what, I do so good. I try to do good. You ever ever thought to yourself, every time I try to do good, it just comes back to bite me. (laughs) Every time I try to help somebody, it just comes back and it turns on me. No matter what good I try to do, it never gets recognized. How easy would it have been for Mordecai to have got to this point. Because see, look what happens in Esther chapter 3 and verse 1. After these things, King Ahasuerus promoted Haman the Agagite. Now who should have been promoted? Mordecai. But that's not who he promotes. 
And what you're going to understand is the reason that this king does this is because this king is a respecter of person. Now what I mean by that, person being status, who you are, what you can give, what abilities and talents you have. God is no respecter of person. God is a respecter of heart. That's all God respects. God doesn't look on man the way we look on man. God looks at the heart. And so what we see in this is this king, because he is a respecter of person, he looks at this man, and when we read the story, you're going to find out that when this enemy forms this plan to kill all the Jews, we find out that he is a very wealthy man. He offers the king 10,000 talents of silver to go into the treasury of the king if he'll follow through with this plan. 10,000 talents of silver in today's money would be about two and a half million dollars. This a rich man. And he's offering the king two and a half million dollars into your treasury to let me go through with this. So the king doesn't promote based on someone's heart, based on their goodness. The king promotes, and this is the way the world does, right? Based on the person. And so there is much disappointment. Not only that, we're going to find out that this Haman is an enemy. The greatest enemy of God's people, of the Jews. Let me show you some examples of that. Look with me at Genesis chapter 36, verse 9 through 12. These are the generations of who? Esau. You remember what the Bible said about Jacob and Esau? Jacob I have loved and Esau I have hated. Esau had the promise of God. He was the eldest. He was the one that the promise of God for the promised land, that the seed would come from him. And yet, you know the story, he traded his birthright for a morsel of food. In other words, he did not believe in the promise of God because he was just concerned about his own. And so he traded. It, it was his unbelief. And God hated Esau because of his unbelief in him. Now let's keep going. These are the generations of Esau, the father of the Edomites in the hill country of Seir. Go to verse 10. These are the names of Esau's sons. Remember this first name, Eliphaz, the son of Adah, the wife of Esau, Reuel, the son of Basemoth, the wife of Esau. The sons of Eliphaz, this is, e this is his firstborn, right? So we're talking about his grandsons here. The sons of Eliphaz were Timon, Omar, Zepho, Gatum, and Kenaz. And then go to verse 12. Tina was the concubine of his firstborn son, Esau's son. She bore, and here's the name to remember, she bore Amalek. Amalek. Now here's the next thing you need to know about Amalek. So first off, God hated Esau, right? Because of his unbelief. And that carried through his, his seed, if you will. They followed the same pattern of unbelief. And then he has a grandson named Amalek. And look what Amalek does to him in Exodus chapter 17, verse 16. Saying, a hand upon the throne of the Lord. The Lord will have war with who? Amalek from how long? These are a sworn enemy of God and His people. Why? Look what they did. Not only did he hate Esau, but look what he did in Exodus 17 verse 8. Here's why. Then Amalek came and fought with Israel at Rephidim. Here's what you need to know. When the Jews were coming out of Egypt, God was saving them, right? God was bringing them to a promised land. Right after they crossed the Red Sea, they came to a place called Rephidim. And the people in the back were the oldest. They were probably the young kids. They were the ones that weren't able to keep up with the track, with, with the rest of the people. Amalek and the Amalekites came in behind them. And you remember the story to where Moses has to stand on the hill and um, Aaron and Joshua are on both sides of him and they're having to help hold his hands up. And every time Moses' hands and the staff goes up, they're winning. But every time Moses gets tired and his hands go down, they begin to lose. This is the battle. It was the Amalekites that were coming in behind them and they were attacking them from their rear. And they were killing off all of the weakest. And is this not what the devil does? The devil comes in and he's not looking for the strongest necessarily in the party. He's looking for you when you are your weakest. 
When everything is stacked against you, when all the discouraging things of the world are hitting you, that's when He comes in and He starts trying to attack you from your rear. And so what we have here is a mallet came and fought. And because of that, God says, I want you to always remember this. Look with me in Deuteronomy chapter 25, verse 17 and 18. Remember what a mallet did to you on the way as you came out of Egypt. This is God talking. How He attacked you on the way when you were faint and weary and cut off your tail. What does that mean? Hit you from behind, right? Those who were lagging behind you and He did not fear God. And so we need to understand that we can never forget. Go with me to the next verse there if you have that, Riley. Deuteronomy 25 verse, um, verse 19. Let me see if it, it finishes this out here. I think it does. Therefore, when the Lord your God has given you rest from all your enemies around in the land that the Lord your God has given you for an inheritance to possess, you shall blot out the memory of Amalek from under heaven. And look at this last part. What does he say? You shall not forget. Amalek, this Agagite, Agag was the king of the Amalekites. And you can find that in the book of Genesis as well. But the point is this. This Haman guy is a sworn enemy to the Jewish people. He comes from the lineage of the people that have been trying to annihilate the children of God. Why? Because Esau was their father. That was supposed to be their promise. But Esau gave it up because they didn't believe. And they're still not fearing God. They're still not trying to, to repent and come back to God. All they're doing is trying to attack and destroy God's people, which is exactly what Cain did to Abel. It's the same spirit of Satan since the beginning. Cain saw his brother's sacrifice was accepted by God, and instead of repenting and coming and doing what his brother did, what did he do? He went and killed his brother. God hates this spirit. God hates this spirit of antichrist, if you will, anti-God. And this is who we're dealing with when we get to Haman. We, and, and so keep reading with me in Esther chapter 3, verse, uh, verse 2. And all the king's servant who were at the king's gate bowed down and paid homage to Haman, for the king had so commanded concerning him. So the king has commanded, you bow down to him. Well, think about it. Mordecai didn't have a problem bowing to the king, so it wasn't about worship here. This was just simply about honor. Even Daniel bowed to the king. Even Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego bowed to the king. This was not something that had to do with worship. This was simply the fact that Mordecai knew who this guy was. He remembered that as a Jew, God had told him, these are my enemies. They're trying to kill you because they hate me. And God said, don't you ever forget it. I am going to have war with this kind of spirit and with this people from generation to generation to generation. In other words, it's not going to end. And so as a result of that, keep reading with me in verse um, 3. Then the king's servants who were at the king's gate said to Mordecai, Why do you transgress the king's command? See, they can't understand this. In verse 4, look what he said. And when they spoke to him day after day, and he would not listen to them, they told Haman in order to see whether Mordecai's words would stand. And here's what he told them day after day. For he had told them that he was what? I'm a Jew. I can't bow to this man. I cannot pay honor and homage to this man because he is anti-God. He is anti-Christ. He's the same spirit that Cain had. He's the same spirit that Goliath had. He's the same spirit that King Saul ended up with. He's the same spirit that, that, that came in King Herod. He's the same spirit that Pharaoh had. He is anti-God. He is anti-Christ. And He is our sworn enemy. And I cannot bow to this man. 
And so what does this man do? Well, the same thing that... So that's the first thing we see is the enemy of God emerges. He refuses to bow because he's a Jew. This is God's ultimate enemy. But now start in verse 5 and look what happens. And when Haman saw that Mordecai did not bow down or pay homage to him, Haman was what? Let me tell you something that Satan can't stand. He can't stand it when you won't bow to him. He can't stand it when he's trying to point you a certain direction and tempt you to go a certain way. He can't stand it when he is trying to, to turn things in his direction and you fight against it. And it fills him with fury. But before you say amen too much, can I tell you that this is the same spirit that you and I have in us except for God. Look with me at Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1 through 5, I believe it is. And you were dead in trespasses and sins. You know what it means to be dead? You can kick that person. You can punch them. You can pinch them. You can do whatever you want. What can they do? You were dead. In your trespasses and sins. And notice this. In which you once walked. And you were walking in it because you were following the course of this world. And you were following the prince of the power of the air, Satan. The spirit that is now at work in who? Sons of disobedience. Sons of disobedience. So here, Satan has a plan to destroy people of faith, to destroy your faith, He comes to only steal, kill, and destroy. He has no other purpose. And He will use disappointment. He will use fear. He will use everything He can to try to stop the plan of God for the good of God's people. He does this with Esther just like He did disappointment with Mordecai. Whenever we get to Esther chapter 4, you're going to see that when this enemy finally comes up with the plan of how he's going to destroy God's people, Mordecai comes to Esther and says, Esther, you've got to do something. We're all going to die. And you know what Esther says? I can't. I can't because anybody that goes to the king without first being called and being bid by his scepter to come, they're going to be killed, including me. And Esther said, I can't do it. And then Mordecai said, Esther, listen. As a matter of fact, let me look at it. Esther chapter 4. Esther chapter 4. Go to that for me if you don't mind. Esther chapter 4 verse... um, Let's look at starting in verse um, 12. I'm sorry, no, not 12. Starting in verse um, 10. Then Esther spoke and commanded him to go to Mordecai and say, this is Esther's response to Mordecai, All the king's servants and the people of the king's provinces know that if any man or woman goes to the king inside the inner court without being called, There is but one law to be put to death, except the one to whom the king holds out the golden scepter so that he may live. But as for me, I have not been called to come in to the king these 30 days. You see what's happening here? So on the one hand, he's trying to shut Mordecai down from stopping his plan for the good of his people with disappointment. He's trying to get him to say, you know what, what good does it do for me to keep... Because, I mean, it, 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 no matter how good I do, the enemy is the one that... Yeah, the age-old question. Why do, why, do good thing, why do bad things happen to good people and good things happen to bad people? God knows what He's doing. And here we have Mordecai, probably disappointed, very sorrowful, wondering why, what was the point? Why, why should I even say anything? And then on the other side, we got Esther who can actually save the people of God, and yet she's scared. I can't. I'm just a girl. I'm just a kid. I'm not even supposed to be queen. I don't even know how I ended up here. I'm from Minor Hill. I mean, um, (laughs) somewhere. Sorry. I don't even know how I ended up here. But I can't go before the king because, I mean, this is, this, is, this is a death sentence for me. But then keep reading with me in verse um, 12. 
And they told Mordecai what Esther had said. And then Mordecai told them to reply to Esther. And listen to Mordecai's reply. Do not think to yourself that in the king's palace you will escape any more than all the other Jews. For if you keep silent at this time, look at Mordecai's faith. This is what I mean by trusting the providence of God in disappointment and fear. Listen to Mordecai's faith. For if you keep silent at this time, relief and deliverance will rise for the Jews from another place. Listen to me. God is sovereign. But you still have a choice. You still have responsibility. And God is going to work the pieces no matter how how it happens. If Esther chooses to overcome fear and disappointment and to trust God's providence and to do, even if it costs her her life, I'm going to trust God. If she chooses to do that, then relief and deliverance and God's plan for His people, she can be a part of it. Or, if she chooses to walk in fear and she chooses to not go before this king, she can choose that. And the thing that you have to understand is that as Mordecai saw it, relief and deliverance is still going to rise. God is going to make sure that His plan goes forth no matter what choice Esther makes. And so I'm not telling you that everything that happens here that God made that person make this choice. No, He didn't. No, He didn't. I am telling you that Mordecai understood that no matter what choice Esther made, relief and deliverance is still going to rise. God is still going to work all things together for the good of those who love Him and are called and comported His purpose. Mordecai trusts that and believes that through disappointment. Mordecai trusts that and believes that through fear. There is nothing the devil has been able to throw at Mordecai yet to make him say, you know what, I give up. I quit. He trusts God. Trust God. And he says, if you stay silent, Relief and deliverance are going to rise for the Jews from another place. But you and your father's house will perish. That's tough. And who knows, I love this, and who knows whether you have not come to the kingdom for such a time as this. Maybe the very reason God has brought you from the bottom of nowhere to the very top is for this very reason. Or maybe Mordecai, who knows, that maybe the reason God has not honored you yet and not, God has not put you where He wants you to be yet is because God knows what He's doing. Amen. Either way, what is our lesson from this? No matter what God is doing in your life, whether it's fear, whether it's disappointment, whether it is sorrow, whether it is happiness, whether everything is going perfect or whether everything is going terrible and everything's falling apart. If you trust God and you believe in His providence, you better know one thing. He works all things together for the good of those who love Him and are calling according to His purpose. We trust God's providence through disappointment, through fear, no matter what the devil and the enemy wants to throw at us because yes, He wants to destroy you. Yes, He's going to disappoint you. Yes, He's going to cause you to fear. Yes, He's going to throw everything He's got at you. And yes, He may even promote some that are your enemy. But does that mean that God don't know what He's doing? God knows exactly what He's doing. And we have to be careful with this spirit in us. This spirit of of we want what we want. This spirit of I want to be worshipped. This spirit of I want to follow what my heart desires. The same spirit that is at work in the sons of disobedience today. And can I tell you that that spirit is still in you and you have to fight it. And so here we see the enemy's anger 
And there are so many times that we deal with that in our own life when we don't get our way, whenever something doesn't bow to us, whenever something doesn't happen the way that we would desire for it to happen. Come on, amen, somebody. We get filled with fury. And then we have to be able to stop. You remember what happened? Jesus um, in Matthew, did I write it down? I think it's Matthew chapter 16, 23. Let me look real quick. Y'all ain't got nowhere to be, dude. I think it's Matthew 16, 23. I didn't write it down. Let me see if that's it. Yep, here we are. Look at this. Actually, let's start in verse 22. Jesus had been telling His disciples that He's fixing to be killed and on the third day He's going to rise again, but they're going to come, they're going to get Him, they're going to attack Him, they're going to kill Him. Now remember, this wasn't Peter's plan. (laughs) Peter's plan was, we're going to go in Jerusalem and this dude has been raising the dead and walking on the water and calming the waves and the wind. This dude fixing to take over. That's Peter's plan. And let me tell you something, I can get behind that plan, can't you? But then all of a sudden... The plan changes. No, actually, they're going to take me, they're going to kill me, they're going to beat me, and Peter's going. That ain't my plan. And look what happens. And Peter took him aside and began to do what? Rebuke him, saying, Far be it from you, Lord, that this should never happen to you. But here's the problem. Peter was looking at his own desires. Peter was looking at his own heart. What he thought God's plan was. What he thought ought to be good for his people. And look what happens. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him saying, Far be it from you, Lord. This shall never happen to you. And look at verse 23. But he turned and said to Peter. Now listen, this is his disciple. But he turns and says to Peter, Get behind me who? He recognized that anti-God spirit that is in each and every one of us when the plan doesn't go the way that we think it should go. Come on, somebody. When the plan didn't go the way I wanted it to work. And he says, get behind me, Satan. Why? You are a hindrance to me. And here's why, y'all listen. For you are not setting your mind on the things of God but on the things of man. You're not looking at what I'm coming to do for my people. You're not looking at what God's plan is. You're only thinking about what's good for you. Can I tell you that the enemy, that's his whole heart. And can I tell you that it's in you too. And you have to be careful that we're always looking at God and we're saying, God, what is your plan and your good for for your people? Because again, the enemy's trying to destroy God's people. And so that's exactly what's happening here in Esther. And so he works through believers. He works through non-believers. He's always trying to work through. So you have to make sure, again, what's the lesson in this? That you're trusting God through all of the disappointment, through all of the fear that you are knowing that God is going to do what is good for His people. God, and let me say this. Let's bring it down to a personal level. God is going to do what is best for you. And does that always mean that that's bringing you to the top and putting you in a kingdom? You see what I'm saying? Peter thought it was. But what you've got to understand is sometimes and a lot of times... A lot of times God's plan for me or God's plan for Daniel ain't what I think it would be. So that's a personal level for you. A personal level. And so I love the fact that Mordecai, he trusts God through disappointment, through fear. And we even know Esther eventually gets to this point and she trusts God through it too. Because she finally says, okay, I'm going to do it. And if I die... I die. But here's what I need y'all to do. I need you to get all the people of God together and I need you to get them to pray and I need you to get them to fast and you need to tell them, I'm going to need protection. 
I'm going to need safety. Because let me tell you something. What do you think the enemy's fixing to do when Esther tries to overcome her fear and stand before this king? The enemy's going to try everything he can to take her out. But in the providence of God, she looks at this thing and she says, I trust him. I trust him. Beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. Next we see the enemy's plan in verses 6 through 11. I don't even have time. All right. But he disdained to lay hands on Mordecai alone. In other words, Mordecai alone is not good enough. Let me tell you something. The devil and the enemy will never be satisfied with just you alone. No, he attacks the weak and he goes after the ones on the behind. But his goal is to get all of you. His goal is to wipe the entire crew out. All right? And so Mordecai, I mean, um, Haman, it's not enough for him to take Mordecai. So as they had made known to him, the people of Mordecai, Haman sought to destroy all the Jews, the people of Mordecai throughout the whole kingdom of Ahasuerus. So in other words, there's not going to be a Jew left. Even the ones that are in Jerusalem right now building, guess what's going to happen to them? They die too. So here's the thing. Satan's over here trying to get them in Ezra and Nehemiah. Y'all remember that? He's over here trying to stop the work. But at the end of the day, he's not satisfied with that alone. No, I'm not satisfied until I find a way to take the whole thing out. And so this is what he's doing in Persia. And don't you know this is probably the reason that God stirred some up to go back to Jerusalem and God stirred some up to stay right there in Persia. See, you are exactly where you need to be, probably. And you need to trust God in that. You need to trust God in that. But then he says, In the first month, which is the month of Nisan, in the twelfth year of King Ahasuerus, they cast pur, they cast lots. See, Haman probably believed like the Jews believed, that God is in control of the lot. And let me tell you something, he is. He is. But the problem is, Haman don't serve the, the God that's in control of the lot. And so he casts a lot and he wants to see when is it going to be the best time for me to accomplish this plan so that it will come forth. And so they cast a lot before Haman day after day. In other words, they're casting lots for every day of this of the month. So is it is it day one? No. Is it day two? No. Is it day three? No. And they ended up, it's the 13th day. Okay, it's the 13th day. It's going to be of that. And then they cast it for month after month until the 12th month. Now they were in the first month of the, of the year. They cast a lot for the 12th month and the 13th day. That means you got 11 months. Now God knows what He's doing because He could have cast a lot and said, okay, tomorrow is the day. But that's not what happened. He gets 11 months. And 11 months is what God gives to overcome Mordecai's disappointment, to overcome Esther's fear, to make sure that God can let His people be involved in the defeat of the enemy. Because let me tell you something. Does God need you to defeat His enemy? But ain't it a blessing to know that God wants to use you in His plan to defeat the enemy? Beautiful, beautiful thing. Keep reading. We'll read to the end of it. It says, Then Haman said to King Ahasuerus, There is a certain people scattered abroad and dispersed among the peoples in all the provinces of your kingdom. Their laws are different from those of every other people. That's true, right? And let me tell you something. This is Satan's M.O. He always has a half-truth in everything that he comes to God's people with. Go back to the wilderness when he tempted Jesus. There was a half-truth in everything that he said. Go back to the Garden of Eden when he's tempted Adam and Eve. There was a half truth in what he said. But a half truth equals to a whole lie. So yes, their laws are different from those of every other people. And they do not keep the king's laws. Well, this is not necessarily true. They keep all the king's laws unless it contradicts the law of their God so that it is not to the king's profit to tolerate them. If it please the king, let it be decreed that they be destroyed, and I will pay 10,000 talents of silver into the hands of those who have charge of the king's business. See, here we go. Satan, he knows how to use the worldly things in order to try to put his pieces in place. And then it says, 
In verse 10, So the king took his signet ring from his hand, and he gave it to Haman the Agagite, the son of Hamadatha, the enemy of the Jews. And the king said to Haman, The money is given to you. In other words, actually what it means is, the money's yours. In other words, if you're going to give, if you're going to give the money, then okay, the, the, the money's yours. Now you go and take care of it. You're going to pay for everything. You're going to put money in my treasure. You're going to make sure you get the word out. All right. I give you my signet ring. You go and do it. The money is given to you. The people are also given to you to do with them as seems good to you. Then the king's scribes were summoned on the thirteenth day of the first month, and an edict according to all that Haman commanded was written to the king's satraps and to the governors over all the provinces and to the officials of all the peoples, to every province in its own script and every people in its own language. It was written in the name of King Ahasuerus and sealed with the king's signet ring. Letters were sent by couriers to all the king's provinces with instruction to destroy, to kill, and to annihilate all the Jews, young and old, women and children, in one day. In other words, how long is it going? To, how long does he give everybody to destroy them? He wants the Jews gone. One day. One day. And he wants it to happen the 13th day of the 12th month, which is the month of Adar. And when you do it, you get to plunder their goods. You get to have everything that's theirs. A copy of the document was to be issued as a decree in every province by proclamation to all the peoples to be ready for that day. The couriers went out hurriedly by order of the king, and the decree was issued in Susa the citadel, and the king and Haman sat down to drink, but the city of Susa was thrown into confusion." Here's the point. We have an enemy. And his goal is to destroy you. And he will use whoever he can and whatever he can to do that. But if you will trust the providence of God, that relief and help will rise for the people of God. God is not going to let those that belong to Him be destroyed, no matter what you do or don't do. And so, if you trust in the providence of God, you better believe that there is no amount of disappointment that will allow the devil to destroy you with. There is no amount of fear that will allow the devil to destroy you with. And no matter what the enemy tries to do, no matter what he brings to you, you better believe that relief is going to rise from God and He will work it all for your good and for His glory. The application, I want to get to this. You've got it on your bulletin if you've got it. First application, trust God's providence when you're trying to do right, but it seems like only bad things still happen. Because that's what Mordecai did, right? And he was wise to do that. Next thing, keep your minds fixed on God's will in every situation of your lives because that's what Peter didn't do. And that's what we have to be careful of. Is God, what what is it that that you would have for me in, in my life and for the good of your people and for your glory? And that's not always easy to figure out, is it? It's not. It's not. But one thing for certain, God promises, those who seek will find. They'll find it. So keep your minds fixed on God's will in every situation in life. Next, pay attention to what you're agreeing to. King Ahasuerus, you notice that he never even asked who these people were. The only thing he heard is two and a half million (laughs) dollars. Can I tell you that sometimes those job offers that you get, I was talking to a man this morning and he was talking about two possible. He's really looking for a job, really wants a job, needs one to help provide for, for himself and for the needs in life. And he's got two, two potential prospects. And yet he told me, he said, I, I need to talk to you because I just don't know for certain if these are going to be. And so his mind and his heart is thinking, before I agree to this, is it going to be good for me and in in God's will for my life? That's wise. Yeah. That's wise. Pay attention to what you're agreeing to. Pay attention to what you're accepting in your life. And then trust God 
even when Satan seems to be winning. Because let me tell you something, at this point, it looked like Satan was winning. For 11 months. (laughs) Y'all hear me? For 11 months, in the eyes of these Jews, it looks like Satan is winning. But did Mordecai and Esther quit trusting God? No. Through disappointment, through fear, they trusted God. Finally, don't be a respecter of person. It'll always come back to bite you. You know how many times I've seen in churches where they they make this one a deacon or make this one a deacon, and they, they make them a deacon a lot of times because they're well off. Now, I'm not saying that's what's done here. I'm just saying I've seen it. Or they make them a deacon because maybe they're an upstanding person in the community. In other words, they're respecting person. I ain't talking about none of y'all, all right? But I'm just saying that in a lot of times in the churches, if we're not careful, we look and we respect person. Can I tell you something? If a man comes in in raggedy clothes and everything else, I hope that you will go to him just as quick as you would anybody in here with a full Italian suit on. I hope that you will not worry. Do you think that God cares if any of you give money to this thing? Do you really think God needs your money? Listen, God's purpose is going to be fulfilled whether you give a dime or not. That's the truth. And so, don't be a respecter of person. Because just like it's fixing to come back to bite King Ahasuerus, because the king don't know that his own very wife is one of these people. And he's fixing to find out the hard way. Don't be a respecter of person who'd come back to bite you. There's your application. If y'all would stand this morning. However, there's so many applications to this lesson. I just pray that you can find one. I don't care how it applies to you, but you ought to be able to find one application from this thing in your life. And you ought to, if nothing else, be able to know that the enemy is coming for you. He is. But if you trust him, through your disappointments, through your fears, if you know that His providence is for your good, then no matter what the enemy tries to do, your faith will not falter. And you will make it. And in the end, it will work out for you. You have God's Word on that.